Boa tarde a todos e todas. Espero que estejam bem e obrigado por terem vindo à minha palestra. I, I guess that, with few exceptions, most of you didn't understand what I just said. Um, if you're curious, the translation was hi. Um, actually, <laughs> I, I started uh, my talk with a, with a language other than English because I want to call your attention to the importance of the meanings associated to the sounds we make during communication. Uh, this is not something unique to humans. As you know, uh, most mammals uh, do make sounds uh, as much as frogs and of course birds. Uh, but what about turtles? Um, so uh, most of you are turtle experts and or all of you and you probably have seen tortoises mating and, and making very loud sounds like this aldabra here. Mm. Right, so this is, mm. this is very common among tortoises and actually it has been known for a long time. There are a few papers published on this. Uh, one good example is this paper published by, uh, or led by Galeotti uh, in 2005, where they found that sounds made by tortoises during mating um, are an uh, honest signal of their, um, of their condition. So it's, it also influences their, their success during mating. Uh, other papers later looking into tortoises uh, also found that they, they do produce other types of sounds using different situations. Uh, and here I have very hard evidence of that. It's, uh, the tortoise is clearly telling the cat some gossip. All right. So uh, what about water turtles? Uh, one of the first papers uh, was supervised by Gerald Kuchlin, uh, uh, in which they look into the Australian uh, long neck, snake neck turtles, uh, Caledina oblonga, and they found out that they produce up to 17 different sounds using in several different situations. Uh, later on, uh, work um, um, led by Camila Ferrara, who's here and also happens to be a co-author in this work I'm, I'm presenting, uh, found out that the, the giant uh, river, South American river turtle, Podocnimis expansa, is able to produce all uh, 11 different sounds. And actually the, the hatchlings are singing from the egg and they synchronize hatch and later on they sing to, to find their parents and they migrate together, being the first case ever reported for post-hatch parental care in turtles, which is already pretty cool. Uh, but later on, uh, there were other accounts on other species of turtles, many of which published by Camila, but also by other people, uh, in which uh, they, they show that other groups of turtles are able to produce sounds as well. And there are some special groups like sea turtles, for example, uh, of which we know that all species do produce sounds. But I was interested in understanding what is the extent of this behavior among turtles. So how, how spread it is among this group and where is it coming from uh, in their evolutionary history. So to do that, I started recording um, a few species that belongs to families that have never been reported to produce sounds until now. So I started with, uh, with the um, South American wood turtle, Rhinoclemis punctularia, and I found out that they produce over 30 different sounds, being the species so far with the biggest uh, repertoire ever reported. And then later on, I uh, recorded the soft shell, Pilochilis bibernai. And this species also produces several different sounds, but it's, um, it's quite special because it's, it's the turtle that communicate the most so far, and uh, they don't stop talking at all. So. Ah. Right, so I, I've... I followed that line of thought and I decided to record a, a few more species. And in the end, I recorded 50 species from all turtle families. And um, it seems that all of them 
talk. And they produce several different sounds. Some of them have very complex repertoire. And uh, together with a literature search for all the species that have been reported to produce sound so far, I plotted this in a tree uh, for all turtle genera. And as you can see in the, uh, with the black dots in the tips of the tree, this is a very widespread behavior among turtles. And honestly, the turtles that don't have this behavior is probably because we never recorded them. Um, and then later on, I, uh, I uh, ran an analysis called the ancestral state reconstruction in which uh, we pretty much used the information from the tips, so from the living species, to infer um, the, the trait in the ancestral. To this, I, I made this to every um, node in the tree. And the conclusion that I got is that the acoustic communication was already present in the common ancestor of all turtles. So with that, I, I answered both of the questions that I wanted to answer. But that also made me think a bit more, uh, because if it was already, um, sorry, if it was already present in the common ancestor of all turtles, it's probably a much older. I kept looking into it, and I found this paper published in 2020 by Chen and Vince, where they pretty much did the same analysis, but for all tetrapods. And the conclusions that they got is that sounds made by uh, mammals, frogs, and birds do not share their evolutionary history. So this is something that uh, these groups converge to. We also checked their data set, and they consider turtles to be non-vocal mostly. So I kept thinking about it, and I, I, I was wondering how my findings could influence their analysis. And uh, to explain that, I produced a very, very simple video. This is not meant for biologists. Uh, it was actually screened in the Swiss Science Film Academy last year in Zurich, and I want to show it to you. You know how sometimes a friend says something that hurts you, and then you're feeling things and thinking things, and you want to say something back? And the way to do so is by communicating through language, so you say things like, you're such a jerk. Um, it turns out in nature that happens as well. So like a birdie wants to have babies and it goes up to the other birdie and it says, Hey birdie, I want to have babies. Could we make some please? Or like a monkey is feeling a bit hungry and it goes up to its friend and it says, Sup fella, I'm feeling a bit hungry. Do you mind if I pick on your crunchy fleas for a snack? Yeah, so it turns out this communication thing is actually quite complicated, but scientists are trying to understand how that happens. Take these naughty froggies, for example. They belong in the same group as the scary crocodile and the silly goat. <coughs> They're all tetrapods. <coughs> yes, tetrapods. Many of which communicate by making funny noises through the respiratory tract. Let's have a look at the tree of life. It seems that animals that communicate with sound develop this ability in different moments. So although frogs, mammals, birds and crocodilians produce sound, their origin is not connected. But now, they found a new missing piece to this puzzle that completely changes the game. We discovered that the use of sound as a way of communicating is widespread among turtles and tortoises. And after recording many different species, we compile valuable information to reassess the origins of this ability among vertebrates. When we include turtles in the group of animals considered to produce calls, our analysis indicates this trait to be present in the common ancestor of all tetrapods. Okay, let me explain what that means. Now that we know that turtles also do emit sound, this new piece to the puzzle shows that vocal communication actually appeared on a common ancestor to all tetrapods, humans included, originating at least 350 million years back. In fact, it could be even longer, given that more primitive animals, such as the lungfish, also produce sound. It seems we're a lot more similar to other animals than we thought. This one, for example, really reminds me of my grandpa. Cool! We good? Right, so we, we follow up on that and we 
recorded not only the South American lungfish, but also other groups of animals that are commonly considered to be non-vocal. Uh, in this case, we recorded a, a, a freshwater Sicilian and two Ataras, and they, they happen to be all very much vocal. Um, so we ran the analysis again with this new data set, and um, we got to a opposite conclusion to, to previous research. And uh, it seems that the uh, origin of acoustic communication is common to all tetrapods. And in this, in this case, coanates, which will be tetrapods plus uh, lungfish. Um, so I think this is pretty cool because we can use turtles uh, to infer and answer questions that are much, much broader than we usually do. And we can say things about other groups, including humans. Um, this, this is something that can be used in research for, for human communication and the origin of human languages, because now we can compare mammals to, to birds and, and to turtles and so on. But I know that most of you are not, in a daily basis at least, interested in all this phylogenetic thing. Um, maybe uh, we can focus then in, in other aspects of turtle communication that can be very useful to your research. So um, we can do a lot of conservation taxonomy and, and natural history with, with uh, acoustics. Uh, if you think, for example, uh, of frogs, there were many species that were recently described um, based on the sounds that they make. So they were cryptic species that look the same, but they, they have their different sounds. And then following this, this cues from the sounds, we use genetics and we describe new species. Um, I'm pretty sure that the same thing can happen with turtles. We might be facing a much greater diversity out there than we realize, and we need to know that to be able to preserve it. Um, and further on conservation, if you think of birds and whales, for example, we know that there are many species that have different populations in which they speak different languages, very much like humans. Um, and it might be the case for turtles as well. And uh, let's say we rescue a turtle from poachers and we want to release it back in the place where it belongs, you definitely don't want to release it in a place where it doesn't speak the language, right? So um, nowadays we, we check these things with population genetics when we can, but this is, this is very cost, uh, costly and time consuming. Uh, and, and if we know the repertoire of these, these animals with just a recorder and a hydrophone and the animal in captivity for one week, we are able to tell where, where it's coming from. So you can do that in the field work. And, um, and of course, um, for behavior, uh, there might be other species of turtles out there uh, doing parental care we don't know about. And maybe there are other behaviors we, we don't even dream about that, that we might discover by just looking into uh, bioacoustics. And uh, well, the, the take home message is when you get back home, just start recording all the turtles you can. And yeah, that's it. So I want to finish my talk by thanking uh, the Swiss government, the, the Swiss uh, National Fund for Science and the, the University of Zurich for funding all my research. And of course, all the institutions that supported me by uh, giving me access to the animals I recorded. And of course, TSA and the symposium organizers for bringing me here and making this talk possible. And my supervisors, the filmmaking uh, crew and the Swiss Science Film Academy for helping me with the video. That's it, thank you.